once you start really completely decoupling the front end presentation layer, you also sort of open up for a whole new ecosystem forming with APIs, services, providers, new open source tools, and so on. The Jamstack, of course, encompasses much more than Netlify. Like we've seen just incredible growth in the last five years, but the whole ecosystem has grown enormously, right? And today there are several different providers in the Jamstack space and all the big cloud providers have Jamstack offerings. And I don't see any sign of that possibly slowing down. Hey, this is Brian, and you're listening to Jamstack Radio, a bi-weekly series where we discuss the Jamstack, a new way of building websites and apps that are fast, secure, and simple to work with. Jamstack Radio is brought to you by Heavybit, a program dedicated to helping startups take their developer products to market. For more information, visit heavybit.com. If you're interested in being a guest on the show, or if you'd like to suggest a topic, find us on Twitter at Jamstack Radio. Welcome to another installment of Jamstack Radio. On the line, we've got the one and only Matt Bielman. Hey, Matt. Hey, great to be back again after a couple of years, I guess. Yeah, it's, it's been quite a few years. Um, a lot's changed. Listeners, when we say a couple of years, Matt was on the podcast episode two. Uh, <laughs> we talked about the inception of the Jamstack and where it's come from and how it sort of got started and like the adoption of the Jamstack at Netlify too as well. Yeah, there's so much history. And it's funny because we just had Ohad on the latest episode that just released today. Oh, nice. Yeah, and it was it was fun to sort of get his story because I've chatted with Ohad a, a lot, but you know, I never got the pieces of his story and how we got involved in Jamstack and started StackBit. So it was nice to get the, the whole story then. So folks, you can check that out. Uh, but Matt, I don't know if people know who you are. Um, <laughs> I'm sure they do, but um, do you want to introduce yourself and like what you do at Netlify? And Yeah, sure. So I'm Matt Billman, and I'm uh, the CEO and co-founder of Netlify. Netlify, of course, we took sort of an early bit on the Jamstack and built a platform for developers to to build and deploy modern websites and applications that follows these Jamstack architectural principles. Yeah, excellent. And like again, I can't reiterate like you were literally on the podcast with me, and we talked about that history. So we can leave that for the listener to go listen to that if you weren't around for all those episodes. Um, but I want to talk about Netlify today. Like we just finished Jamstack Home, so just last week. So if you want to know the date of when we're recording this, like there were quite a few things that shipped um, just in a conference, and I love, I love the lightning talks uh, when it's like the, um, what is it called the the sh- lightning launches? Lightning launches, yeah. So I, I saw Chris and his uh, the Toast Dev, yeah, um, and a couple other things, but yeah, Netlify launched something. Do you want to talk about what y'all shipped? Yeah, absolutely. Right. So um, one of our big releases at the conference was a a new feature we call Edge Handlers that we've been working on for quite a while and that we started opening up sort of the early access of now. And um, originally when we started, like we built out our Edge network and we had this declarative rules engine, right? So you could pre-build any HTML, CSS, JavaScript, push it directly to the Edge and then you could redirect or rewrite rules, right? That would be able to do quite a few things with like rewrites or GOIP based rewrite, language based rewrite, even like authentication based rewrite, but it's still just like a declarative rule set, right? Then back in 2017 or so, we introduced Netlify functions that really added this concept of, of a compute layer, right? Like where you could run code on Netlify dynamically, right? But really targeted towards the idea of like, you get the initial HTML from the Edge node directly, and then you can start doing API calls to functions and use them as microservices and so on, right? But architecturally, we still we could still see that there was some use cases where you couldn't quite get all the way there just with a declarative rule set at the Edge. And you needed to do something during the request response cycle, right? Like, for example, more fine-grained authentication patterns than just deciding, like, does this user have this role or or another role, right? Things like, instead of just saying, if the user is in this country, show this, maybe saying, we are a large retailer. If the end user opens up the site from a location that's really close to one of our stores, then show that store directly and otherwise show a generic page, right? Like that's like more logic than you can fit into just a declarative rule. So edge handlers really take that whole edge routing, response transformation layer, all of that, and makes it completely programmable in JavaScript. So you can just write whatever logic you want there. 
and that's of course something I'm really excited about. Also, sort of as a new building block for the Jam stake. Yeah, that's fascinating too, as well. And like, I'm, I'm a Netlify Functions user, and uh, I have a Stripe store to sell stickers hosted on Netlify, powered by Next, and all the bells and whistles. And uh, I think that's fascinating too, as well, because I remember. So your co-founder Chris, uh, also my former boss, um, <laughs> I remember chatting about one of the, um, the things that he was super excited about when he was uh, in Denmark for an agency, and I think it came up around Pokemon Go, <laughs> yeah, uh, and having like the ability to like know when people are in certain places and using AR to actually identify, you know, there's a group of people here trying to catch this Pokemon. Let's all collaborate. Yeah, and like uh, it might be a stretch, but maybe this is like where we're. Where the jam stack is going, where yeah. there were limitations to like functions, and there were limitations to only hosting on the jam, and I think you're creeping to the edge. I guess is the, <laughs> yeah. the term I'll use and the phrase. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty excited to like every time you build a, a primitive like this that developers can use. One of the most fascinating thing as as someone who builds a platform is is to see all the sort of original things that people come up with and start building with it, right? Like, so I'm really curious to see that. I think. There's a lot of use cases that are sort of quite enterprisey. Again, like I mentioned, like big retailers doing geolocalization and like yeah. companies doing personalization, uh, fine grained A/B testing, maybe like using it for edge includes for really really big sites and so on, right? But I think there's also a ton of opportunity just for for developers to poke around and come up with with new patterns and new ideas. Like for example, let's say you you're building. A site generator, and you want to try to build device-specific bundles, for example, right? So you serve different bundles based on browser capabilities or something like that, right? Like you wouldn't really be able to to necessarily deliver on with just the current rules engine, right? But you could totally just write an edge handler that would say, like, if this user agent serve this bundle, otherwise this other bundle, right? Like this, there's, there's all these creative things that people can start experimenting with that I'm really looking forward to. Yeah, I mean, that's really, really intriguing too as well. Um, Because I know like, this is a little more of a naive example too as well, but I know like things like when you launch on Product Hunt, it usually has a ref code. Yeah. And with that ref code, you can treat the site differently based on that. Totally. Um, Yeah, for example. But also just being able to infer, like not actually have like uh, manipulate the actual URL uh, to change what's happening, like actually infer what should happen is kind of mind-blowing to be quite honest. And like, it's stuff that I would think I would need a server, like I have to go reach for a node server to constantly check and, and make sure this is working. But what you're saying is that you're able to actually compute this on the edge and do that logic. Yeah, that was a great example. That one would be fun to implement. Like things like a, like reacting to the referrer and so on. That's that's totally possible, right? And it should be really easy to work with with this model. Yeah, yeah. You need to activate your developer experience folks to uh, when you move the beta and launch uh, on Prodicon again. Yeah, I'll totally bring on the tip. <laughs> I hope you haven't patented it already. Or <laughs> oh, no, no, yeah, no. It sounds like I, I'm, I'm consulting right now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll look for the check in the mail. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and honestly, like, what Netlify is sort of unearthed, it's a movement, like the Jamstack is a movement that you, not just Netlify is driving towards, but you see so many other companies also taking part. Like, I'm super impressed with the, with all the plugin ecosystem as well, so Fauna being one, I think Algolia was just announced too as well recently. Yeah. Snick as well, yeah. Nimbella is another interesting oh, yeah. one. They they basically launched the whole new uh, serverless runtime for Netlify, basically, right? Like wow. as a plugin, that's that's really cool. Yeah, and you mentioned the term primitive, which I, I think is like really apt um, for the idea of what this is because. Netlify, you launch the feature, the edge handlers, as a idea of like go ahead and run with it, like developers. And I'm sure your enterprise customers are also sort of bending it to the, its will. <laughs> yeah, of course. But individuals are able to take those primitives and wrap their own ecosystem around it, and which is mind-boggling that like at Netlify, like you're an ecosystem, you're a platform, you have these primitives that people can now sort of add their hooks into and build their their own ecosystems on top of. So now it's going to be like. I don't know if this is like too forward thinking, but like, is it possible that Netlify could be another like, not a flavor of AWS, but perhaps like building its own infrastructure for people to adopt these patterns without then the need of getting lost in the console? Yeah, I mean, to some degree, right? Like, we really are building out like you could call it like kind of a serverless cloud, right? That's also not like in the same way tied to one provider. So we are not like building our own search solution or, or our own 
database solution and so on, right? But we are starting to really make it extremely easy to combine and work with all these different providers and primitives, right? Like in the FonaDB add-on is a great example. Algolia add-on is a great example. Of course, what sets us apart is like being still quite opinionated around the architecture, right? Like that's what makes it possible for us to to make it so much simpler to work with, right? And so much easier to set up, right? Like you can only do that if you have an some sort of architectural opinion, right? Like otherwise, it's a question of like at what level do the primitives you give people lie on, right? And of course, for AWS, it's like very low level infrastructure primitive yeah. that are very powerful, right? But since you can do everything with them, just figuring out how to put them together for common purposes can be a lot of work and maintaining that can be a lot of work, right? So <laughs> when we can come with a more opinionated idea around like what should your stack look like, then we can take a lot of the friction of doing all of that work and, and just remove it so developers can just like work in their Git repository and, and the infrastructure sort of just flows from there. Yeah, and honestly, like the opinions that Netlify is shipping uh, on the backs of these features, I love. Like, So I've been doing a lot of live streaming, which uh, listeners, you, you're very familiar, I've been live streaming on Twitch. But I was able to like launch a new design system by using a subdomain on a URL I already owned that was managed by Netlify's domain management system. Nice. And the effort that I did to make all that work, uh, it was sort of like an afterthought. It was like, oh, this should be on a subdomain. <laughs> Let me go ahead and fill it out in the form. It works within 30 seconds. I'm now moving on to the next problem. And I'm not trying to figure out like things like DNS and waiting for things to propagate. Like It's just magically working. And I could see this, this edge handler, this compute layer of me being able to find out take advantage of these primitives. I haven't had a chance to actually dig in as of yet, but the concept uh, I'm familiar with, and I'm excited to actually start doing some of these sort of unique situations, because like I think you're at home, I'm at home, we're having this conversation through Zoom. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And to, to be able to have like a, a unique experience where now I'm actually chatting with people in India on a regular basis through the content I'm doing. Yeah. Like if I wanted to provide a unique experience. Yeah. So like I'd mentioned I have a, um, a store powered by Stripe, like being able to just understand if someone from India has logged in, like provide them their, their own price, their own yeah. stickers, their own whatever, based on what I can ship there. Like now I can do that on the computer. Layer. Yeah, that's really cool. That's a cool. I'll, I'll make sure you get early access. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think I clicked the button. I might be in a list somewhere. I have to follow up with your emails. <laughs> uh, I mean, as a former employee, I'm, I'm still pretty diehard on Netlify and trying to make sure that <laughs> all my stuff runs there and like being able to showcase the features that exist. And I love the fact that I don't have to be I don't have to be a DevOps engineer in addition to my front end UI skill set. I don't have to you know manage servers, and that's that's what I want. Yeah. The other thing we we announced at the conference uh, as a new primitive as well that's that's coming really soon to all users at least on the pro tier and up is. Uh, is background functions. Oh, nice. Yeah, so that's another compute layer, right, where Netlify functions is always meant to run like during a request response cycle, right? Like, So they're great for microservices, API endpoints, and so on, right? But sometimes you just want to start a process. Like if someone buys something through your Stripe shop, maybe you want to tell them immediately, like, I've gotten your order, but then you want to run a process that maybe like, connects to some API to tell some service to sell stickers and send mail to you telling that someone bought it and all of these things, right? That you would rather just have happen in an asynchronous function that can run at its own. So we're launching uh, background functions for that. And it's like, I think we came to a pretty elegant solution by just having like any function you have, if you just append to the name of it dash background, then it will run in the background when you trigger it instead of running in the foreground, right? Like, so they're really... Really simple to write. So that's a, a new feature for functions today? Like it's uh, available? It's coming end of month. In the month? Okay, I'll, I'll be looking forward to that. Because I've been stretching functions uh, a bit and trying to see where the ceiling lives. As, as I mentioned, like I like I like the architecture, I like Jamstack, I like writing UI, and I don't like writing a lot of server-based stuff because I just, yeah. I want to operate in the space that I am comfortable in, and that's where I'm comfortable. And uh, with Netlify, I get opinions of how to get things done and how to ship it quickly. So yeah, that's exciting. I'm looking forward to that. And I, I actually missed that announcement uh, during the conference. Awesome. Yeah, I'm pretty excited about those as well. I think it's time to give us like a, a really complete set of primitives with like edge handlers for anything that you can do in a few milliseconds directly at the edge, like routing, transformations, anything like that. And then functions for like 
anything you can do within a second or two in like an API response and then background functions for any longer running compute tasks. Again, I'm also excited to see what people start building with them. Yeah, me too. I'm excited to start building. So we, we covered the edge handlers, we covered um, the opinions and these primitives. And I think these opinions are, are strong enough that we recently just announced within the last, uh, actually four weeks, I think, it was earlier at the beginning of the month, Netlify crossed a million developers on the platform, yeah. uh, which is congratulations. Yeah, thanks. In the previous podcast, I said congratulations to Netlify when it happened. Yeah. Um, but now I'm saying it directly to your to your face and saying congratulations. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, you remember when when we were like six people back in Doc Patch <laughs> and starting to build all of this, right? Like, yeah. So it's been amazing to see like the whole community form around the Jamstack, right? And and of course, like seeing that part of like, of course, there's many other platforms, many other players in the space now, and the whole category is like maturing and growing up, right? But seeing like that amount of developers coming onto our platform. And by now, of course, we passed right through that million mark and have been like really just keep seeing that that level of growth, right? Like reaching that many developers is, is pretty incredible, right? Yeah, it is. And I remember, it's funny because I remember having the conversation of us just deciding to even like adopt the term Jamstack and the way that we explain Netlify and like, are you yeah. are you using Jamstack to be able to ship sites and that if it's yes, yeah. you can use Netlify. And like having that conversation, like I would have never thought we'd be here, you know, four, <laughs> four and a half years later. Yeah. And now we have a million developers using Netlify today. Yeah. Which also seemed like a pie in the sky number. Yeah. As you saw, like understand the timing for the listeners. Like this was at the time where like Firebase was just now deploying the Google version of Firebase. Yeah. Uh, and they had the Firebase deploy. And then we saw parse basically shut down. We saw all these other tools like shutting down and like pivoting or getting acquired. So like didn't know like what would happen with the space and how it was going to grow. And Yeah. I mean, obviously a few of us were crazy enough to have a pretty strong belief. In, our hope from the beginning was very much that we had nailed the right part of, of what's in a fundamental architectural change that's going to happen. And what is it that we can build something really long and, and lasting on top of versus what's the part of the stack that sort of keeps changing very fastly and keep iterating very fastly, right? Like if you think back to when we started, Angular was like the biggest thing when we started out, right? And yeah. seemed like unbeatable, right? And suddenly React came along and became everything, right? And there's so many different like frameworks and flavors of the day that's been coming and going in, in all of that time, right? It's been such a a space of like rapid innovation, right? But I think we identified pretty correctly that this tendency to really make the front end and the sort of front end web layer its own thing decoupled from the back end layer. And this tendency of the back end layer to start just splitting up into different APIs and services where like some are your own services, but a lot of them are other people's services like Stripe or Goalie and so on. I think that observation has really held through till now, right? Like, and of course, that's been what's powering this idea of a Jamstack architecture. And it's also really the framework that we built Netlify around saying, like, if this is happening, what are, again, like the platform elements, the primitives, the workflows we can give developers to be really successful when building with that paradigm? And yeah, it's proven to really stand the, the test of time. Like, as you mentioned, like frameworks are coming and going and like flavors of JavaScript. Like recently, we saw Moment.js uh, move into maintenance mode. Yeah. And now people are now choosing new versions of how to handle date time. So, like, maybe it's like too harsh to say it's a fickle ecosystem, the JavaScript ecosystem, front end ecosystem. But I think that's really what it is. It's kind of true. Like, now we have Rust runtimes that are faster and compute time. And yeah, really interesting. Yeah. And I, I shipped uh, some Rust uh, <laughs> things to Tal. I think he had a blog post nice. uh, and shipped a, a Rust powered Netlify function. To power my front end JavaScript code, I was nice. hanging out in the party corgi chat, and he posted it, in, and I'm like, "Oh, I'm going to run through this." <sighs> uh, and in like ten minutes, I had a, a Rust powered front end hosted on Netlify, uh, which was amazing. Nice, that's awesome. I I also just uh, wrote my first bits of of Rust, and uh, yeah, it's it's a really cool language. Our, our whole edge layer now, we rewrote sort of the core edge layer of Netlify in Rust, in part to really build the capabilities we would need to offer edge handlers. And that, that's been a really interesting process. Talk about uh, a language that stood the test of time and sort of as people were, because I know even like five years ago when Rust was sort of just kind of entering in the, the scene, yeah. 
and people figuring out like Mozilla putting a lot of effort behind of it. Now you're seeing Rust really getting adopted, even on the web and the browser with WebAssembly. Honestly, I'm not surprised to hear that you, you wrote stuff in Rust because it seems to be <laughs> um, where Go was the language of, for the cloud. Like Rust is um, now being adopted in the CDN programming, edge layer programming, if you want to get that speed. Yeah, it's a really, it's a really interesting language. I mean, we obviously still use a ton of Go in our infrastructure, right? But um, for us, Rust really looks like the ideal replacement for anything we used to do in C++. For sure, yeah. So I wanted to transition to a, a couple different things. Like, So at the Jamstack Conf, you had a conversation with Matt Mullenweg. Uh, I believe I pronounced his last name correctly. He was the co-founder of WordPress. It was a great to hear the conversation and to hear his side. Um, I spent the last episode actually chatting with Ohad about his response to the blog post yeah. and sort of understanding like where Matt was coming from and saying that Jamstack had some issues. Uh, and we sort of talked through those issues in the last episode. But I'd love to actually talk to you about that too as well in that conversation. Basically, the state of the Jamstack moving forward. Like we, we now have opportunity with Netlify to host um, edge compute layers and yeah. be able to write that code and make sure that works. But yeah. Yeah. And of course, it, again, it's, it's worth really remembering that the Jamstack, of course, encompasses much more than Netlify, right? Like we've seen just incredible growth in the last five years and, and keep seeing that, right? But the whole ecosystem has grown enormously, right? And today there's several different providers in the Jamstack space and, and all the big cloud providers have Jamstack offerings, right? Like, and I don't see any sign of that possibly slowing down, right? Again, I, I'm very convinced of this tendency for the web front end layer to be its own thing happening, right? And that's, of course, the point of contention with, with Matt Mullenweg because in itself, we have lots of clients using WordPress successfully with Netlify and with a Jamstack approach, right? Like it's become a quite popular headless backend for Jamstack projects, uh, live chat had a great case study out uh, around how, how they rebuilt their whole front end uh, with a Jamstack approach, but still using WordPress as a, as a headless layer. And, and we see, see a ton of those use cases, right? But of course, I would say that that for Automatic as a WordPress company, having that what Matt referred to as the integrated approach, right? Where all the templates and plugins and everything live together in one monolithic system, it's probably quite essential to to the way they have built a business model, right? And of course, that's probably where some of the disagreement comes around, right? That of course, once you start really completely decoupling the front end presentation layer, you also sort of open up for a whole new ecosystem forming with all these different APIs, services, providers, new open source tools, and so on. And uh, I'm very positive towards that, and and probably automatic sees it in a in a different way. Yeah, and honestly, I think with automatic, uh, like with WordPress specifically, kind of being powering such a large amount of the web, I think there's opportunity for them to get very comfortable in what that means uh, and being part of the web. But I think in the conversation, what I got uh, as a, a listener of the conversation is that you both were making really good points, but I don't know if you're having the same conversation where Matt was really was focused on the space that they own and are really dominating in. Yeah. And your conversation was actually about the space that's being created. And I, I look at it like, I know the joke has been said about uh, your developer experience uh, engineer, uh, Cassidy, being the TikTok developer advocate, <laughs> which is like, she's amazing on Twitter. Her videos are top notch. Like I am engaged in every single one of them. I know exactly what tweets she's sending from the Netlify account to as well. <laughs> Her humor is like right on point uh, and it's welcoming. And the fact that she's also on TikTok and she's doing developer <laughs> engaged content is something that if you're doing developer experience or you're developer relations, uh, and I have a point what I'm getting to, but what I'm saying is that TikTok is something that you probably want to pay attention to as far as content goes, because now people are paying attention to it. But I, I think the same way where TikTok is something that I could be like, ah, oh, no, Facebook or Twitter is to where I need to be. I think it's the same thing with WordPress, where I feel like WordPress could say, or Automatic could say, this is the place where everything's happening. This is where I could the future. Uh, and then one day TikTok comes and uh, upseats them. And I think it's the same thing with the Jamstack, whether it's Netlify, whether it's Vercel, whether it's Gatsby, whatever whatever the, the tool is, yeah. there's so many other players that are now growing adoption. And it's very exciting to, to see that. Yeah, I think it's always with, with any of these things, right? Like there's always like 
a group of people you should pay attention to, right? Like with social media, it's probably good to look at really young people and see like, what are they starting to adopt? Because that tends to be a pretty good indicator that that thing in the future will be really interesting, right? And with technology, I think it's it's very often about looking at the developers, right? Like I remember back when I bought my first uh, MacBook like ages ago, right? After having had Windows computers for, for quite a while and so on, right? Like, and I played around with Linux and so on, but I bought this MacBook and it suddenly came with like a Linux terminal essentially, but together with this beautiful operating system and so on. And I got really excited. And then as I started to go to developer conferences, I suddenly started just seeing like more and more developers with these MacBooks, even if like at that time it was still like Windows machines was just completely dominating, right? Like, and, and Apple was a very little thing, right? But I think. Once the developers really started getting on board and getting interested, right? Like then they started building all these things for Mac, right? And suddenly it became a really vibrant, really interesting ecosystem. And that's, I think we're seeing some of the same with with the Jamstack right now, right? We're seeing that, of course, right now it's, it's appealing more to a developer audience, right? And the adoption of it is quite driven by developers. But I also think that's a sign that like, once developers really start adopting something, then they start building on top of it and they start being creative around it, right? Like, and that's what I think we'll see happening around the Jamstack, and that's why I'm still, I'm, I'm of course very bullish on, on this ball keeping on rolling and getting bigger. <laughs> yeah, and honestly, well said. Like seeing that adoption in Mac in the the end of the the last, uh, I guess, decade yeah. or the decade before last. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah. yeah, what is time these days? Um, yeah, who knows? But you, you bring up Mac, and I think of the um, in pure speculation. But I remember when I was in college, Steve Jobs saying, "We're never going to make a phone." <laughs> and then, like literally six months later, they're like, "Oh, here's a phone." Um, <laughs> yeah. Pure speculation, so you, feel free not to comment. But uh, I wonder if Automatic releases their Jamstack approach because uh, they already have <laughs> yeah, the WordPress API. See. So, like, if I just want to stand up a front end that's powered by you know stuff that connects to WordPress pretty easily, and I get my CMS, yeah, it would be a good play for them, to be quite honest. Yeah. I mean, it would be awesome for the ecosystem. And, and I mean, we've seen some of the other more traditional, like monolithic CMS, especially like Ghost took like a really radical, like yeah. re-architecture and said like, hey, we're going to really split up the front end layer and the back end layer. And I've seen Craft CMS going a bit in that direction and at least like really taking the, the headless story series, right? So so I think there's plenty of room for these existing providers to to do that. Yeah, and it's a testament to the architecture too as well, being able to... I saw this with Forestry and Tina CMS where they have like their experiments. Yeah. What's well, it's not an experiment anymore, but it's like a legitimate solution at this point. But they're able to test this out and be like, hey, we have this other thing that is kind of it's not closed source, but it's like a system that you have to could be all in. Yeah. But we have this other thing which is open source and it's headless. Like we're gonna try this and see if this is gonna work. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And also another example of like once you get developers excited, they start building all these tools for marketeers and for content editors and so on, right? Yeah. That I'm very excited about because I think I think there's going to be a lot of innovation and advances made also for content editors and non-technical users based on developers being able to focus in a more like, I'll build a service just around the content editing experience or just around like the live previewing experience and having that focus, I think, in the end will make each of the services really interesting and really great. Yeah, excellent. I mean, you mentioned that you're very bullish on the jam. I'm bullish on the jam. Like, I'm all about the jam here. Uh, pump up the jam, all <laughs> the above. Um, but with that being said, I want to put aside some time for jam picks as well. But uh, was there any sort of last words, anything else you want to mention about Netlify that folks to sort of try out things coming down the, uh, the roadmap? Um, I mean, go sign up for early access for edge handlers and stay tuned for and a cool announcement for with the background functions coming out end of the month. And just stay tuned in general. We, we have a lot of exciting things on the roadmap. Excellent. Awesome. Well, shipping, no matter what environment, uh, I love it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, looking forward to getting my hands on these features and trying them out and <laughs> writing my content and, and talking about them. So. With that being said, we're going to transition to jam picks. These are things that we're jamming on. It could be movie, food, tech-related. Uh, nothing's out of bounds. But yeah, at this time in the world, like we are always trying to keep ourselves um, energized, which if you don't mind, I'll go first, Matt, and share my picks. Yeah. So my first pick is Snowpack. Snowpack is a, a bundler. One of the last blog posts I wrote uh, for Netlify was actually 
a comparison of different bundler tools. And I've like never forgot all that research I did to make those bundlers work and test them out and sort of like sort of see what, where the ceiling was for that. What I love about Snowpack is they've taken what you like about Webpack, but also what you like the ease of use with things, something like Parcel, and they've combined that. So now you got fully configurable functionality and you just literally just install it. It is inferred and uh, you have an entire developer environment with Babel and all the other sort of cross compilation and stuff like that. So big fan of Snowpack. I actually had Fred, who's uh, one of the lead maintainers on that project uh, on the podcast here, nice. which was my introduction to Snowpack and I, I'm a big fan of it. I find it really interesting as well. I guess I would then pick Chris Piscari's toast that you also mentioned yeah. there earlier, like his new site generator that's like Rust tooling for like a JavaScript site generator and so on. And I, and I think that's that's really interesting, right? Also because like there's just, when you talk about building lots of content and so on, I think the fact that JavaScript itself doesn't have any kind of concurrency model that can take advantage of uh, shared memory, right? Like you can only like spin out individual processes with their own memory objects and so on, right? But you can't really like put a content model into memory, make it immutable, and then just run a ton of parallel processes with access to the same block of memory. That will always like sort of hold back the limits for like how fast can you build like really vast content-based sites with a static approach, right? And I think once you start moving into Rustland and so on, that becomes like a completely different ball game. Yeah. So I'm pretty fascinated to see those kind of interesting mixtures where you can make like parts of the plugin system or like specific rules and so on programmable in, in JavaScript, but sort of make the core engine based on on a language that can give you very very different performance characteristics. Yeah, I'm a big fan and I've been watching it from afar. And I'm super happy that it's now um, in a usable state. I chatted with Chris like right before, like he actually came on and talked about MDX uh, on the podcast, and uh, I need to have him on back on, and we'll give a, a nice toast talk. Which like what a what a great name to talk about the jam. <laughs> toast to toast. <laughs> Excellent. So Matt, thanks for coming on and, and chatting. Uh, just like giving me update with Netlify, update with all the things that you're shipping, the stuff that you will be shipping soon. I'm sure listeners are, are ready to start signing up for these alphas and the the soon to be betas for the background functions. And uh, yeah, thanks for your time. Thanks for having me. Uh, And listeners, keep spreading the jam. That's all the time we have for today. If you're interested in being a guest on the show or if you'd like to suggest a topic, find us on Twitter at Jamstack Radio. To learn more about Heavybit, visit heavybit.com. And while you're there, check out their library. It's packed with amazing talks on sales, marketing, product, and general management from founders of developer tools companies and other industry leaders. 